Well, I want to I want to start off today by uh, recognizing all our veterans. Today is Veterans Day, and do we have any veterans in here today? We got some back here. Thank you. You know, I just want to remind everybody we have an incredible Veterans Resource Center downstairs. And in case you didn't read any of the announcements about it, uh, for the second year in a row, we were named the number one career and technical college for veterans in the United States. So not too often we get a number one ranking in New Mexico. What I want to do today, I want to recognize a, a few people and a few programs. Uh, some of them may be here, some of them may not be here. Uh, I'll give you a few updates. Um, I want to thank everybody who participated by putting suggestions and our questions in the boxes around campus. Uh, that's uh, real important. And then we'll just kind of open it up uh, to discussions. Um, first of all, I don't know if we have very many people here. I see some. I want to recognize both our first year experience team and our financial aid office. They've worked really hard to lower the number of students who are going into debt to take college. They've lowered the amount of dollars that have been borrowed by our students by over 50%. And we're really trying to have our students not leave here in debt if they don't have to be. And so, uh, who's here from First Year Student Success and Financial Aid? Stand up. I got a little something for you. Some of you may have some of these, but if, you can always use a fresh one. These are the little, the little things you put on your phone that you can use to, uh, to clean it. Okay. Is Sahaj here today? Sahaj isn't here today, but Sahaj Khalsa, he's head of our emergency medical services program. He just got national recognition for a research project he's involved in. His project examining the impact of a paramedic entrance exam on, the, on predicting student success, won Best Research Award for the year at the National Association of EMS Educators Conference in Nashville, and he was accepted to present at a conference in Australia. He had, didn't know it, but he has to take his president with him. <laughs> and he also just returned from Alaska where he's a keynote speaker at their 40th annual EMS Symposium. So uh, congratulations uh, to Sahesh. Uh, Jenny Landon's not here because I think she had to go to Rio Doso for our TAC grant uh, advisory committee meeting. But she's going to be going to D.C. where she's going to be, uh, was invited by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to talk about academic progression in the nursing program and what we've done in New Mexico to align our curriculum amongst the two-year and four-year schools, which is one of the reasons why we have a partnership to offer a bachelor's degree uh, completion program uh, here in Santa Fe. So that's a great honor for her to be invited to uh, talk in Washington, D.C. on that one. Uh, is Janelle here? I didn't see Janelle. She's in session, okay. Well, Janelle Johnson was just returned from the uh, Texas Counseling Association's annual conference where she pre presented on interventions with cognitive behavioral therapy and complementary therapies, the powerful way to engage college students. So uh, she's representing us. She's part of a national organization now, too. In fact, she's, I think, a national officer in the American Council, Secretary in the American oh, Treasurer. Okay. So congratulate her. Is Valerie Grimley here? Mm -hmm. Well, if you see Valerie Grimley and you say, hello, Dr. Grimley. <laughs> she completed her dissertation and is now a, a PhD. <laughs> also want to recognize uh, Santa Fe Community College and our de design team who worked on the Higher Education uh, Center project. Uh, we're getting an award at the upcoming New Mexico Commercial Realtors Association for Design Excellence. And Henry uh, Minardo is going to represent us there. And I don't think Henry is, is here this afternoon. But uh, that building has been a great building so far. As with all buildings, there's a few issues and a checklist that's being worked on uh, as the warranty runs out. But it's been a great building uh, for both uh, the even the great design, the natural lighting, which we have in many of our buildings, but also for the, uh, the fact that we have not had an electric bill that we've had to pay. We've been getting paid, so it's been great. Um, I want to con 
congratulate the Santa Fe Literary Review, uh, Kate McCahill and uh, Miriam Sagan, who's kind of transferred that. Uh, they had a great uh, uh, kind of opening last week. I know you've seen the literary review around campus, uh, but many people came and did readings. Uh, it was really incredible. We even had a state senator who came and read. I, I didn't realize that he was in the book until um, he read at the event last week. So congratulations to the Santa Fe Literary Review on what they've done. And I got to thank the nursing students. I know Susan's out there. They did, they did flu shots. How many people got a flu shot last week? I did. And I didn't even feel it. So give some of those back to your staff. Okay. It's a great event to get flu shots. And uh, the fact that we get to do that here on campus, uh, and it's a freebie. Okay. Um, Dawn Wink, is, I don't think Dawn is here this afternoon, is she? Oh, there she is, Dawn. She served as the MC at the Tony Hillerman Writers Conference, right? Congratulations. All right. And Diane Tenter is probably not here because I bet she's in the hallway selling jewelry. If you haven't visited the table out there, they're raising money again uh, for the Nepal relief efforts. And at last year's event, they raised enough money to build one and a half houses in this village in Nepal. So uh, go out there if you, and shop a little bit if you haven't done so already. They've got some great bargains. I just saw a bracelet that somebody bought with uh, old movie star pictures on it for a dollar. <laughs> so uh, but thank uh, Diane for her work. Uh, she's also the, um, on the... Uh, uh, presented on the artist Ansem Kiefer at UNM's Institute of International Studies, and she has a show at the New Mexico School for the Arts. And Patricia Pierce, who I don't believe is here, uh, but she has a book, ar book arts exhibit at the Capitol Rotunda and also at St. John's College. And I know there are many of you who are doing things like that. Make sure you get that information to me uh, or to Janet Wise, because we want to recognize all of you uh, for the things that you're doing uh, throughout Dr. the college. Dr. Grimley, yay! <laughs> this, is what, this is what you get for being a, completing your PhD. A couple of things that are coming up. I just want to remind everybody on November the 20th, we're going to all, hopefully all of us will be over at the uh, fitness center uh, in the gymnasium. We're going to be meeting uh, to help kind of make a group decision on what should be the focus of our Title V application. Uh, there's over 20, I think, ideas uh, that have been submitted. We're going to be posting those. It's posted, it's posted on Jack. So you get a chance to go out there, do a little homework before you come. Go out there and read those various ideas and come prepared to join in a discussion as we try to narrow down what should be the focus of our application for a Title V grant. And, you know, I'm, many of the ideas are incredible, and I think many of them can probably even be merged together uh, to do a comprehensive uh, program. But we want to hear your input. There will be time, I think, at the event for you to even share other ideas that might come up uh, as we talk about things. So don't forget that. Lunch will be provided. Uh, and I'm going to encourage everybody, and I'll send out an email about this. If you have a, a bottle that you can keep liquid in that has a top on it, Uta and the rest of the staff at the fitness center would love it. If you brought this as we put it on our table, we're trying to protect the, the floor in the gymnasium. Uh, we'll have a few things over there for you to use, but uh, we're going to try to be extra careful. That's about the only place we can have an all-college event with tables and chairs. And so we want to see how we can make it work. And uh, in advance, I'm going to thank uh, the plan operations and maintenance staff for doing a setup. And some of them agreed to put in a little overtime to break it down afterwards. But it's going to be really important for us. Uh, this is an effort for us to improve our cross-campus collaboration and communication. And uh, from what I've seen so far in the work of the task force that's putting the ideas together, been going around and working with each of you, uh, it's doing what we hoped it would do. It's getting us all talking about the same things and trying to move forward, uh, focusing on student success. So I think it's going to be really important. Um, 
Also on December 10th, which I believe is the Thursday, uh, this year the Celebrations Committee, instead of doing the traditional uh, or the fairly traditional Friday night uh, Christmas type party, we've decided to have a campus potluck. I think we're going to try to do it in the atrium. You'll get a little more information about it. Uh, we'll probably have food service uh, prepare some of the main items, encourage people to, to bring a potluck, but it'll be uh, in the atrium. We'll send you some details about that, but it's going to be on Thursday, December 10th, uh, probably 11 to 1-ish time frame, uh, and we'll get, you, get back to you on that one. The other things before I uh, go to some of the questions that were turned into this uh, and suggestions in the suggestion box, I uh, just want to remind everybody uh, we're still in that time period where finances are really tight. Uh, if you don't need to spend any money for the, through the middle of December, do not. Uh, if you really need it for operations, for classes, we can figure out a way to do it. Uh, despite the rumors that some of you may heard, we will be making every payroll. Uh, but we don't have enough cash to pay all of our bills in a timely manner. So we will be slow paying. Uh, some of our vendors, uh, some of our vendors we're working with because we can pay everything in middle of December because we get that huge influx of cash from the county. Uh, so thank all of you once again for last year sacrificing salary, most of you, uh, for sacrificing some of your budget uh, and for supplies and expense and really watching what you spent. We did increase our cash balance for this past June 30th enough that we didn't have to worry about payroll uh, through December. Uh, but we do still have to worry about our vendors in some cases. Uh, we do have to try, plan on the timing of expenditure of cash. And, you know, it's going to take, as I said a year ago, it's going to take three to five years to get our cash balance back to where it needs to be so we don't have to worry about those situations in November and early December uh, while we're waiting for that big influx of two-thirds of our revenue from the county. And the county is half of our uh, operating budget. So thank you all for, for what you've done to get us uh, uh, this far in doing that. We uh, went through the, the suggestion boxes that we did around campus. I want to thank Jan and other people who put that together. Uh, as a result, I think we got a lot more uh, comments and some questions. Uh, many of them are, are, are similar, um, but a lot of them related to in categories for parking and transportation. One thing that keeps coming up is handicapped parking and where it's located. And I know in the West Wing, it's over in the West Wing and it's not in the short-term parking area. We have looked at moving it to the short-term parking area, but the problem is the grade of the parking lot is too steep to meet code. And so in order to move the handicapped parking there, we would have to regrade the parking lot, which is quite expensive to do. Our plan, however, is when it becomes time to do the re, uh, to resurface, that's the best time for us to regrade uh, the parking lot. Um, I think they're probably full most of the time, but I do want to remind people who use the West Ring, there's actually quite a few handicapped parking spaces over in front of the entrance to the Art Wing, and that's very close to the main front entrance. So for people um, who, uh, who are coming in the front entrance, that's just as close as the West Wing. Uh, we have expanded the number of handicapped parking spots uh, at the fitness center and we will, as we always do in the spring, be adding some more because we will be doing tax help again this year. And that's a community service that I feel we just have to continue. It puts about $10 million back in our economy with tax refunds, uh, primarily for low income people who uh, don't have the skills uh, to do their own taxes or need some help with that. Uh, we have looked at other locations. We haven't found any yet. So I feel like it's still a better, uh, it's a use. They are taxpayers in our community. They do help pay for not only our salaries, but for the buildings that we use. And so uh, uh, we, we will be doing that again this year. We are exploring possibly having some kind of shuttle in case the parking lot gets full. Uh, we haven't quite figured out how we can do that yet because we need a little extra funding uh, to help pay for some of those drivers or use volunteers, uh, but we are still looking into that and that could be, uh, could be happening. I know there's been some, there were some comments related to the bus service, the fact that today is Veterans Day and so I guess the city buses uh, aren't running. Um, we're working with the Metropolitan Transit Authority. Uh, Rebecca Estrada is on 
one of their task forces. Uh, we're trying to figure out how we can get more bus service out here. Um, if there's a way for us to even link some kind of concierge shuttle service from the campus to bus stops or to the 599 rail service, uh, obviously that would cost us some money, but we are looking at those ideas. Unfortunately for the city, they're having to look at their budget and they're having trouble with their budget and they aren't getting enough ridership on the buses. And, you know, it's kind of a, in a way, I'm afraid it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Until they have more buses and better, more routes, they're not going to get the ridership. But if they don't get the ridership, they're not going to have any buses and routes. Mm -hmm. So we're working with them on that. Uh, we did work, especially through our Veterans Resource Center, we did work to get uh, veterans uh, bus passes. And uh, we are looking at the potential of maybe adding a small fee to every student uh, and they would automatically get a bus pass. And I don't know if that would really increase ridership or not, but we are looking into what that might be and that's something we'll be talking further to Student Government Association about. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I think that has helped this year is that we did open the Higher Education Center. And it seems like our parking lots are not as full as they used to be because we've taken about 500 students a day um, off of this campus and, and over to that campus. Um, I know there are times that we still get full, but it used to be you had to go all the way to the back of the two main parking lots. I do know there are still issues over around the back side for health sciences, uh, so we will be looking at that best we can. Uh, just to let you know, we're going to be doing an update to our campus master plan. So we're in the process of going out to an RFP uh, to bring a consultant in. Part of that will be to talk to the campus community. They will come around and talk to the different departments. Uh, we'll talk with the external community as well. And so as you identify those kind of needs, let them know about that. It doesn't mean we have to know exactly what the solution is, but if we need more parking on that side of the building, make sure that's shared uh, with the folks as we go through and update the master plan. Because it costs money to build parking lots, and uh, whatever we do, whether it's money that we get from the state through the severance tax bonds, which can be allocated every year, uh, through the geo bonds, or if we even go out to our own election, we need to have it in our campus master plan. This is what we have prioritized are our next uh, things to do. And so that includes buildings, if we want to do buildings, it includes remodeling, it includes parking. One of the things that will have to be in our plan that we will have to pay for is we do have to pay for half of the extension of College Road from where it currently ends at the entrance, the north entrance of the campus to wherever the new connector road is. We all want it to be further east, but the further east it is, the more it's going to cost us. So we, we have put together a preliminary budget for where we now think it's going to be, and we are trying to get the money from next year's legislature to help us uh, cover for that. Uh, it could be something that could be in a bond election, though, uh, in the future. Uh, so keep that, keep that one in mind. There are a number of uh, questions and suggestions around uh, um, campus safety and security. Um, there was a question about uh, there's too many um, students, I'm assuming, uh, smoking dope on campus and in the parking lots. Um, we do not allow that. So if we know it's happening, safety and security deals with it. And I just want to, I know this came up a number of times, medical marijuana cannot be used on campus either. And even though it's legal to use medical marijuana, we would be at risk of losing all of our federal financial aid and federal resources if it was known that we allowed it on campus. So if you, if you know people are doing drugs of any type on campus, uh, if you report it, we do have to deal with it, okay? So uh, it's not something that we just ignore and we can't ignore it because it does put our federal financial aid and other federal dollars uh, at risk. Um, I think a number of the uh, uh, suggestions have actually come from students. And I think that's great that they came in. And you know, I have to always remember that when you get questions and suggestions, they tend to be a little more focused uh, on the negative things and the positive things. But there were a lot of really positive comments about 
facilities and about programs and about people. But there are also a lot of comments about uh, lack of customer service. And so I just want to encourage all of you as we go about our day-to-day -day jobs uh, to think about you know, the image that we're projecting on behalf of the college to our students. And as employees of the college, uh, we have to be, hold ourselves to a higher standard than we do to our, to our students and our external customers. But I don't think it's a huge problem. But just keep in mind, because we all get frustrated. I get frustrated every day about something. But we have to be careful about how we, uh, we appear uh, to each other and to uh, our students and our community members. There's a number of things that relate uh, to facilities. And I just want to remind everybody, uh, we did, did approve almost $3 million worth of capital projects that we're going to be doing this year. Many of them are renovations and updates. But because of our cash flow situation, we have really put all of those off until January because we got to make sure we have the cash in hand because even if the state reimburses us for it, we have to spend the money first, bill the state, and the state's not always the most timely in paying their bills either. So we had to make sure we, we have, have that. A lot of comments have come related to carpet. I do know we uh, have, we, we, clean, we clean the carpets mostly when you ask, okay? So if you think the carpets in your area need a deep cleaning, we, we vacuum every day. But if you think you need a deep cleaning, turn in a request to plan operations and maintenance. I understand we just got a new piece of equipment that's gonna help us with carpet cleaning. And so we were sort of down with that a little bit. Uh, we do have a plan in that project plan, and I believe it's still on Jack for all the capital projects, to update and replace uh, the carpet in some areas which has been very old. And I do know that some of those places will start this spring. Uh, I can't tell you which ones uh, right now, but, but there is a plan in place. Uh, so we are going to be doing more carpet upgrades. Uh, there were still some comments about carpet in the halls. I don't know that there's too many places where we still have carpet in the halls. In most places, we've replaced them with tile because it's longer lasting and e easier to clean. But there still be some places uh, where we have to, uh, have to do that and get, get that updated. So uh, some of those are, are in the plan, but we, we do hear you on that. Um, there were a couple things related to the stairs to the track at the fitness center. Uh, I thought that we did the stairs last week. Was that one side? So I don't know if this is an older... Ah, okay. Stand up and introduce yourself. This is one of our newer employees. I'm Keith Bristol. I'm the new campus planner. I'm an architect, and uh, I'm sure that all of you are going to have requests for me very soon now that you know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was part, that was part of the plan. <laughs> okay. I did meet uh, with, before I came over here, I did meet with the, uh, the staff over in the, in the fitness center, and so a lot of our conversations over there related to uh, equipment and getting on track with updating and replacing older equipment and out-of-date equipment. Uh, we are behind primarily because of our, of our financial situation, both during the recession, but also our financial situation of last week. And, and I want to just give you an example of, and I hope I got this right, Jeremy, you're still here. Based upon our policy just for computers around campus, whether they're in labs or in offices or in classrooms, uh, we have a plan that certain types need to be upgraded every three years, four years, five years, depending upon what it is. Right now, to update all the ones that we're past due on updating, it would take $650,000. We don't have $650,000. So we're trying to find new ways of doing that and going out to it. So we, we hear you on those kind of situations. It is very costly to update it. Um, we will be starting the budget process here soon, so we will be encouraging managers to talk about what is the, what is the priority. All these things need to be updated, but what's the top priority and why? And we're, gonna, we're just going to have to weed through it for a while until we do get the, uh, the, the funds to do that. So that relates to computers, it relates to uh, fitness equipment in the fitness center, it re really relates to any type uh, of equipment around campus. And uh, uh, so uh, we hear you on that. It's just I don't, we don't have the money unless 
Somebody goes out and wins the Powerball and wants to give it to us. Uh, we would take it. You could get a tax write-off if you want to do that. So. Another thing that came up in here and both over there it relates to our outdoor track. Uh, we are still trying to figure out what we want to do with that. Uh, it, does, it is costly to keep that upgraded. The last time we did it, six months later, it needed to be done again. And so once again, it's one of those issues where in a campus conversation with the master plan, we need to talk about it. Do we spend sixty dollars to $100,000 to uh, update something that's been used by 20 or maybe 100 students? Or, or do we spend that money somewhere where we have thousands of students being impacted? We've got to have those conversations, and that, that'll be part of that campus master plan update, as well as the conversations we'll have as we go through our uh, budget process for next year. In the category, really, of being uh, general academic quality concerns, uh, this may be my favorite one. I'm assuming this came from a student. There need to be more girls on campus. <laughs> About 60% of our students are female, so anyway. There, there were a few uh, questions and concerns about the, uh, the student evaluations of their classes. Uh, that is something we're looking at as a project. And uh, Jill, do you want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in that area? I think this might be a good time uh, to talk about that for a second. They told me if you use this or I stand near you, it gets recorded. So. I'll try this. <laughs> I'm not being fresh. We're just trying to record for the video. Oh, yeah, okay. So hopefully this works. Um, so, yes, we are. Uh, I, I'm a member of an Equip Action project that's working on um, rolling out the online course evaluation um, uh, system that we're doing now. It, we've always done IDEA. Um, now it's IDEA and Canvas Labs. Canvas Labs provides the online platform. Um, and we rolled it out in the summer. It went very well. We were very excited about this tool, and um, especially uh, one of the really great things about it is that the results come back to the faculty members so quickly, um, and they can review the feedback from the students. They can see the written comments. Um, we were really excited about this. That being said, <laughs> uh, we have had some issues this semester with um, some of the early courses that have been carried out. Uh, uh, there's been some frustration over access. Some students and some faculty members um, have had difficulty um, using the system. We're working really hard with Campus Labs to get through those problems, and we hope that this um, final batch, this uh, batch of the 16-week courses and the second eight-week um, courses will go much more smoothly, and that um, faculty and students will be as excited about this <laughs> tool as we hoped they would be at the beginning. Um, we do want to say that we understand that um, faculty that did have issues with it, we understand that the response rates are low. We're going to work towards improving those, especially next semester, but we'd really like to have everyone's involvement and participation this semester. And if you do have issues, please report them so that we can address them. Thank you. <laughs> sure. We had a few comments, and these have to be from students too, but a number of comments about the fact that we close at 10 o'clock. Uh, some students uh, feel like they need longer access to some of their open labs. So I think that's something that we need to talk to Student Government Association about and really try to figure out uh, how big an issue that is and, is, and is there a way to still allow some access to open labs without having to have the whole campus open? It becomes a security issue and a staffing issue. Now, Great. That's a good idea. So thank you for that. So if you hear if you hear of the issues like that, you know how would we do it and how would we market it? Uh, you know, if we only do it during midterms and finals weeks or even the week before, uh, from a cost standpoint, it's uh, not as great to have more security around. And if we can figure out a way to, you know, have certain labs but not the whole campus open, that's our biggest challenge. Our buildings are all so interconnected, we can't really close one off without closing off the other. But, uh, I, you know, I hadn't heard that before, so it was great to get that feedback uh, from the students. 
Why are books to the bookstore so expensive? <laughs> we're, we're looking at that. We're trying to figure that out, but uh, uh, we're doing things. And we, we do have some projects going on to try to uh, see what we could do. There were a number that talked about the kindness of the people in our community and the confidence building that uh, they have had for being here. And there's one which I can't find right now, but it basically said they love it here at college because people don't care what they look like. When they were in high school, everybody cared about what you look like. And here it doesn't matter. So that's kind of nice to hear. So anyway. So that's kind of a summary of all those things that got turned in. I, you know, I'd like to uh, try to respond to any open questions or, or issues or opportunities to, to share uh, some positive events. And Scott wasn't here earlier, but when I recognized him for his work on loans. But here you go, Scott. What questions do we have? Emily. Let me give you this so, you, because the, so the recorder can hear it. <laughs> My earrings are going to blow this money out. Um, two dollars at the new hall sale. Um, I, I wanted to say that uh, this weekend, the Human Rights Alliance held their scholarship fundraising gala um, to raise money for a scholarship for LGBTQ plus students here. Um, and they raised thousands of dollars and um, over ten thousand over ten thousand um, dollars and uh randy came and, and gave a wonderful and short as a short. and short short and sweet speech but i especially wanted to acknowledge giovanni grego because he went above and beyond um he did the sound for the event and he was extremely helpful. He even had an extra tie for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, he put his time and effort in in the afternoon and also briefly the day before. And, you know, everybody in that whole organization went on and on about how helpful he was and how he's such an incredible ally to that community. So I really wanted to acknowledge. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this, but not only does he have another tie, he has dress earrings. <laughs> Other questions, comments, anything you want to share with anybody? Yeah, Marcos. Thank you, Randy. All right, SFCC community, so on December 1st, we are having our Super Bowl event for the Office of Recruitment and Outreach. And for all of SFCC, we are having our Santa Fe Community College first annual open house. What does that mean? That means that every single department that wants to be a part of this amazing event that is open to the entire community, so high school students, non-traditional, family, friends, grandma, grandpa, bring them all. It is all of our responsibility. We can bring a thousand people here if we all tell somebody. December 1st. 4 to 7 p.m. right out there in the campus center. If you're interested in having a table, I am more than happy to have that. The dream right here is to have over 100 SFCC departments out there and programs represented in the campus center. So December 1st, 4 to 7, open house. All right. How can you turn that down? <laughs> I think we need to get you on the radio every day. <laughs> By the way, uh, this Friday on the uh, Richard Zeed show, which is, I can't remember which channel it is on radio. It's Hutton Broadcasting. Anyway, uh, uh, Kim Shanahan is filling in for Richard Eads, and we have about five different people from the college uh, that are gonna be on in different half hour segments talking about, Clark's gonna talk about the Red Dot Gallery. Uh, I think Amanda's gonna talk about some programs. Uh, who else in here is gonna be on? Luke, are you going to be on? Okay, so Luke's going to be on talking about some things. So we're, we're excited about that. Uh, it's interesting because I don't listen to talk radio, but every time I'm on talk radio, the phone rings off the wall, <laughs> asking questions back at the office about how do you do this, how do you do that. So it's a great way to get the local news out for, uh, for the college and for programs. Yeah. Anybody else? My name is Alma Rivera, and I'm the program coordinator for Enlace, Engaging Latino Communities for Education. And some of you guys might have seen 
our students on campus today. We had about 55 middle school students touring this afternoon. So we tried to have them keep it down, but of course their excitement was just um, overflowing. So I wanted to say, of course, thank you to my colleague Marcos for the, as you guys see, he does an awesome presentation and he gives free stuff to the students so they get excited. But I mostly wanted to share um, some of the feedback from the students that, that, that stayed with me. So of course they were here on a field trip, they got on their bus, they got off their bus, they were here with the teacher. But their question was, when do we get to come back? Is it freshman year when we're signing up for dual credit? You know, is it when it's time to register for college? And so um, our message to them is, this is your college now. This is the Santa Fe Community College and you're part of Santa Fe's community. So within LASA, we'll continue to host family days here and we'll continue to promote that. But I guess my question to you, um, President Grissom and to our colleagues is, how do we promote a more family-friendly campus? Or just make sure that that's getting out there to our community, whether it's our middle school students that know that they can come have lunch here, you know, with their families, or they can come take advantage of the fitness center, or whether it's our students, who I have seen because I'm a mother, who will be watching their kids at campus center, okay, you go to class, and they do that tag team. So because it's part of my reality, I get to see it more, and, and I acknowledge and support those students, but campus-wide, I just want to have us all think about how do, how do we have community, you know, equal family, and that our community and our students know they're welcome here anytime. I'd like to ask if anybody wants to re reply to that, uh, to say a few words. You know, I, I'm, I think it's an important thing. I think community's in our name for a reason. Uh, I think we do a lot of things uh, to serve the community. And so I think the more we can do uh, to make different parts of our community feel uh, welcome here. And I know sometimes I think we almost look too nice for some people. And so they don't know if they can fit in here. But as we get people here, they fit in. And so we're getting more students uh, from parts of town we didn't get used to uh, get students from. But we do have to think about the families themselves. I know with uh, Jennifer and the early childhood, uh, they're talking about the two generational model. Uh, you know, not only do we need to provide quality education for birth to pre-K and get people ready to go to kindergarten, but we also have to talk about the families themselves because of the whole cycle of poverty, getting involved, and so it builds our whole community up. So I want to thank Marcos and Rebecca and lots of other people. We, you know, uh, our pipeline for the future are those young students. And I think we've all learned that we really have to get the elementary school and middle school students over here. Because once they get to high school, it's not too late to get them thinking about going to college, but it's pretty darn close to it. And it seems like it's those middle schoolers who are the most active, but they also get the most exciting about what they see around here. So does anybody else have any comments they'd like to make about that? like to mention that um, I don't know if anyone else is aware but the culinary program has a great outreach during the summer and I've met some of those young chefs and they've come here and they love it so maybe you could do something about that like more during the school year but I know those kids really love coming here and learning the skills and putting them into practice and if any of you have ideas and I'll give the mic to, to Gordon here any ideas on how we could even expand some of the things we do, especially in the summertime, uh, targeting uh, kids from the community. Yeah, um, we have about 500 kids over the summer that come and participate in the continuing education programs. And I do have to say that the climate on campus from the adults towards having kids on campus has gotten much better in recently than it was 10, 15 years ago when people used to scowl if they saw an eight-year-old. Um, and uh, we hope to build on that. We were 100 students more this year than we were the year before. And the other exciting thing is we're working with the foundation. And this year, for the first time, we'll have scholarships for kids. Kind of related to that, you know, in our dual credit programs, we do waive uh, the tuition uh, for the juniors and seniors because they're, they're the ones we get state funding for. But they still are responsible for paying for course fees. And so it's been a real challenge, especially in some of those areas like emergency medical services where there is a course fee that we can't waive. 
uh, because they have to take national exams to get backups, uh, uh, to get background checks and a variety of things. And through the foundation, we have been raising scholarships so that we don't have to rule out any dual credit student because they can't afford to pay the course fee. So uh, I, know, I don't think anybody from the foundation is here this afternoon, but we're, we're trying to raise money uh, for that for the foundation too. Any other comments, questions? All right. Well, thanks everybody for showing up. And I think there's probably still some more goodies back there. Uh, don't forget, uh, starting at noon on the 20th, we'll be over at the Fitness Center. So thank you. Have a good day.